I've thought a lot recently about what it means to be a leader in 2020, about being a female leader of color in the time of both COVID and a political and racial reckoning, and running a nonprofit that's built on hope when some days hope feels like it's in short supply. As the founder and executive director of Girls Garage, which is where I'm sitting right now, I give girls the literal tools to build the world they want to see. Girls come here to learn carpentry, welding, architecture, and activist art, and how to use their creative power to build projects for our community. I should tell you, though, that I have never confidently self-identified as a leader until this year, even though I've led this work and organization for the past 12 years. I just never felt that the title or the club of people who claimed it was really meant for me. I always felt too young, too female, too not white, too covered in sawdust or underdressed to really own it. In March, the shelter in place orders forced us to temporarily close our doors. We moved our three after school programs online. We made 200 builder kits for kids. We assembled 1500 face shields for healthcare workers and recorded hours of video tutorials. June 2nd was scheduled to be the publication day for the Girls Garage book, an encyclopedia of tools and build-it-yourself projects that I had been working on for three and a half years. But in the weeks prior, there was George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. There was pain and there was no cause for celebration. And then June 2nd, the day of the book's launch, was declared Blackout Tuesday. We all went silent, we canceled the book launch, and we gave space to the voices and stories that mattered, including the girls of color in our program. That morning, I woke up sobbing, totally defeated. My colleague Christy showed up at my door at 9 a.m. with a congrats on the book gift, and I cried on her shoulder uncontrollably. And then I stayed in my pajamas the rest of the day, completely undone. It was all too much. The violence and injustice that I couldn't unsee, the pain some of our own girls were experiencing in their homes and neighborhoods, the sheer exhaustion from the pandemic pivots, the grief of losing my own moment of celebration, and then the guilt of my selfishness for feeling that grief. After months of hustle, the words Black Lives Matter unlocked a geyser of feelings that I could no longer hold back. But this breakdown wasn't a collapse, nor was it a lesson in self-care. It wasn't telling me to take time off or to start journaling or to make more space for my feelings every day because my emotions have always served a different purpose. They tell me to stop and listen, to recalibrate, and then to get up and get going. They challenge me to reorient myself around hope and to make space for others to feel hope too. As a leader, my work often feels like pushing a boulder up a mountain, heavy and relentless. In recent months, it had felt more like pushing three boulders up a hill with two hands, one for operations, one for my colleagues, and one for my girls. But somehow I hadn't let the boulders slip. Because despite how we romanticize failure as a way of learning and growing, most female leaders know that there are certain times when failure is just not an option. I could not fail my girls, and we could not fail the demands of the moment. The next day, standing in our empty workshop, I looked around at the tools on the wall, our big community table, the posters screen printed by girls with messages like, believe women, and I came here for a better life. I checked in with my colleagues, co-instructors, most of our girls and families, asking how were they doing, what did they need? And then I got to work. I assembled fully stocked toolboxes for the 2018 girls in our now virtual summer program, and then delivered them to each girl's doorstep to keep and use for life. My co-instructor Augusta and I led them with their new tools in their own homes through two building projects, a chair, building our own seats at the table, and modular shelves for a nearby food pantry. A few days later, one of our teen girls called me and asked if she could come to Girls Garage to screen print protest posters. I told her, heck yeah, and let's send out the bat call. 10 girls from our activist art class showed up to make signs for a student-led protest in Oakland the next day. A few of our senior girls were feeling overwhelmed by graduation and the uncertainties of college. So I convened a Zoom advisory group for our class of 2020 girls to share these feelings and connect with college advisors, including my own mother. In July, we built a 500 square foot chicken pavilion for a local urban farm. 
We showed up on site masked and socially distant, three, four women and 14 of our most veteran girls. We hoisted giant roof beams in the air, we wielded power saws, we laughed and cried and we bled, and then we stood back and we said, we built that. When my superhuman colleagues had their own breakdowns, they cried on my shoulder and we mapped a new plan that focused on joy instead of despair and relationships rather than metrics. And on the last day of virtual summer camp, I delivered a single egg to the home of one of our preteen girls who needed it for our engineering challenge but whose family was unable to get to the store. This year, I've learned to feel all the hard things deeply and then to act to do whatever is necessary for the people I love. I've learned that when things get exponentially hard, you have to know why you're doing what you're doing before you figure out how to do it. And I've claimed the title leader without apology because I am the person who will bring a single egg or a fully stocked toolbox to your doorstep. We leaders must always show up. We will sometimes break down, but we will never let the boulders fall. <laughs>